Hello, 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 and welcome to Mathematically Yu-Gi-Oh! Today, we're going to be discussing the art of bricking. We're going to be talking about some amazing subjects, like the birthday paradox. We're going to be talking about Exodia, and we're going to be talking about the heart of the cards, and how that all plays into one when it, terms, uh, when it comes to bricking, improving our odds of not bricking, and also many other things that I'm telling you, I, um, I can almost promise you, you're going to learn something about Yu-Gi-Oh! that you've never knew before that's going to help you in your daily game-to-game -game play. I promise you that. And if and if I didn't, you can call me a liar in the comments. Uh, I'm going to jump right in, and I'm going to show you right away. I'm going to get right into the meat uh, and potatoes of what I'm talking about. So when we're playing Yu-Gi-Oh!, we can either be running a play set uh, of a card, three of them. We can either be running two car copies of a card, or we could be running one copy of a card, right? When it comes to bricking, let's just talk about our odds in general, right? To see one copy of a one uh, of a playset, you have a thirty percent exactly to see just one of them. To see two, a pair of our playset, we have a three point five four percent chance to see it. And to see all three of our playset in our first hand in a forty card deck, we have just a point one percent chance. Which means one in about a thousand games we're gonna see our three of a kind or trips uh which is a great hand in poker but we not in Yu-Gi-Oh, right that's a uh, first thing about bricking to see uh these these two of a kind uh, when we're running two ofs in our hands we have a 22 percent and a 1.28 percent respectively uh to 1.28 to brick on our two copy cards and there's a lot of cards that you might want to be running two of that you don't want to see like destiny hero malicious parallel exceeds etc etc finally when we get to our last copy the cards that we can only run one of we have a 12.5 percent chance to see that which isn't that good it's all right depending on how you look at it uh, but it's also our brick ratio too for running our side frame gear driver 1.25 percent chance to see our bricks interesting now this data right here is for a 40 card deck and specifically i want you to look at the 3.54 and the one because i'm going to be talking about that shortly that's 3.64 to see two or more of a playset. anyways let me just show you the data for those that are curious just briefly uh what it looks like for a 60 card deck i don't like to discriminate here let's show you the 60 card deck odds and here it is I'm just going to show it on screen. Uh, the 8.33 uh, value is to note of the one of a kind. Uh, that's your good chance you could bury garnets. Anyways, that's your percentages for the 60 card decks. But let's go back to what I wanted to talk about and what's called the birthday paradox and how this has to do with consistent decks that brick. Like what? That doesn't make sense. How can a consistent deck brick? Well, it's because of the birthday paradox and this isn't talked about much i've never seen this talked about in Yu-Gi-Oh at all really uh and the birthday paradox basically says that if there is uh like 25 people in a classroom there's more likely than not that two of them are going to share the same birthday in fact if there's 75 people in a room the odds are 99 percent chance two of them are going to share the birthday crazy i know uh, the math is just great. But how does this apply to Yu-Gi-Oh? Well, let's say we're running a bunch of playsets, consistent playsets that we want to see, right? Like we're running three Ash Blossoms, three Nibs, and then we're playing uh, Snake Eyes. I'm going to use an example here, right? So we're running three of these starter cards, the Spoils, the Witch, and the Ash, right? Snake Eye Ash. Well, Remember, we had the 3.64% chance to see more than two copies or more. It was 3.5 to see two and the 0.1 to see three. That equals 3.64. Well, now we also have the 3.64 to see our Nibiru bricks. 3.64, 3.64, so on and so forth. So what that means is, while it wasn't that crazy when we were just looking at Ash Blossom alone, in the aggregate and in the sum, the more of these play sets that we run the deadlier it is that we're going to see our, our five card hand our starter hand is now going to turn into maybe a four card starter hand and that's going to hurt us if we're going first because now not all of our cards are in play and so even though we're running this very consistent deck somehow now it uh, all of a sudden we might be bricking more than usual because our five turns to four 
And what I mean by that, when I ran the numbers, when you get to about eight play sets of, 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 um, in your deck, um, I've seen a lot of cards that run like 12, 13 play sets even. Um, but I've seen them mostly, I've seen a lot of 11s. Once you get more than eight play sets, one in every three games, you have about a 33% chance you're going to draw two of your play sets. Uh, that means you're going to draw like two Ash Blossoms or two Nibs, something like that. So what do we do here in this scenario? Well, in this scenario, I would say keep your starters, right? Because you want to be running between 12 to 15 starters, right? So, and I have a video on that too. If you're interested in that, check that out. 12 to 15 starters. So keep that. Maybe you would take out a Nib or an ash and check your deck for some other of your play sets that 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 aren't really your starters that you could get of and put in maybe something that's not hard once per turn like i'm i'm gonna use infinite impermanence here as an example we don't mind seeing more than one copy it won't really count against you because it's got utility going first second etc maybe take out a nib and put in a ghost bell maybe take out in one nib and put in a droll and lockbird etc etc because now you're you're changing your odds now maybe maybe nibs really good in the format and that's not the card you want to target right maybe it's the ash right and actually uh ash isn't might some some are saying that ash is not good this format uh mbt made a video about murder your darlings or something we're saying take out or just consider how many ashes you're running not he didn't say take out them just said consider it because it's not really good in this format and don't just blind put it in and i'm also reiterating that because in this birthday paradox when we're running all of these copies again in the aggregate it starts to run up that your five card hands turn to four cards and in modern Yu-Gi-Oh, every card counts so when you're running these tournaments and i've seen these decks on uh master dual meta Yu-Gi-Oh pro all of etc etc that they're running these 12 play sets and they're like hyper consistent decks but they're not topping anything they're not winning anything right they get to maybe like the, the round of eight or something but they don't win it's because this small flaw in deck building is actually adding up so very cons carefully consider that but now let's move on to the next topic. We just talked about running play sets and how that can be bad. But now we're going to be doing the flip side of it and how running many one copy, one card copies is bad. And I'm going to be thinking in the mind of an Exodia player that likes to run all these one card copies, right? And that's actually not good either. So because there's a lot of people that run, oh, I won one, run one, one of this, one, 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 one. Uh, so I don't brick on anything. Well, let's take a look at how that math works out. Here's how that math works out. All right. So, and this, this is also a story too. The, this this friend I know, he always says he drew Exodia right off the top. Uh, I think three or four times he says, right? And here's the odds of that happening, right? So... You have five pieces of Exodia, the legs, the arms, whatever, whatnot. You have a five out of 40 to get that first piece. Boop, because that's the first card you draw. Now, if you draw it, there's four cards left, 39 cards. You got a four out of 39 to get the a second piece of Exodia. Similarly, your third card is a three out of 38. Remember, these are all one ofs. That means the second to last, uh, the penultimate card is the two of 37. And your final card, that last head of Exodia to get the good head it is a one out of 36 percent chance to find that last piece of exodia right and to put this all together and my friend that says that he gets it all the time well he's actually got a whopping 0.000159 percent chance to just draw exodia off the top of your deck like that which means he is either a liar or he is a cheater, or maybe both. Um, so, uh, I don't think he's gotten that. Because, I don't know how many people play poker, but your odds of getting a royal flush in poker is 0 .000154 to get a royal flush. And that's because even though there's 52 cards in poker, there's four suits. So, it is more likely to draw all five pieces of Exodia than to get the best hand in poker ever. So... Anyways, that just means if you're running all of these one card copies and you have five or more of these one card copies and you want all of them in your hand at once, well, the odds aren't looking good, right? 
I hope I hopefully a lot of them are searchers. Let's move on to the next topic, which is the heart of the cards, right? And the odds to draw the heart of the cards and how to improve those odds to, to see the, the, the especially the one particular card that you might want to see and, and to brick less, especially when you're hoping for a certain card and you don't pull it. Here's a cool trick you can do. Oh, but before I talk about that trick, this reminds me, if you're interested in videos like this that go over different paradoxes, theories, graphs, data, if you like this stuff, please like and subscribe to my channel. I love making videos like this. Please leave, leave, type in the comments. Tell me what you want to see, what you liked, what you want to discuss. We always discuss math and great subjects down in the comments and theories. And it's a great community that's been growing over the last couple weeks here. It's been awesome. Please, please, please come check it out. I have, a, like I said, a lot of videos on two card combos, uh, starter cards. Is, is uh, this card worth it or not, right? Sideframe gear, gamma, etc, etc, etc. Lots of videos for you to check out if you like data and statistics. Anyways, back to the heart of the cards. So, the heart of the cards, right? When we are talking about the heart of the cards, let's say we're running a, f a 40 card deck. You have between a 2.85 to a 50% chance to get that one card you need. That one card that's going to save you from that stunt player, right? And that's because, right, if you have two cards left in your deck, you have a 50% chance to get it, right? One out of two. And if you have 35, you've got the 2.85% chance. Let's further extrapolate this da raw data and I can further tell you what I'm talking about. So... Taking the numbers from 35 to 11, when we're talking about that heart of the cards moment, again, you have between the 2.86 to a 9.09% chance to draw that one card you need, right? Uh, similarly, once you get below 10 cards, the odds start increasing exponentially that you're going to get the heart of the cards, that one card you need. So how can we manipulate uh, these heart of the cards, right? Well, I am particularly a fan of running e even after, right? I have my starter card ratios, which you'll see in, in, in the videos. I have my hand traps. I make sure I run like I try to run more like 20 hand traps. But I'm also a fan of running draw cards, thinning your deck, making sure your deck is even thinner to hyper consistent. So I'm a big fan. My snake eye decks. In Master Duel, I have Chicken Games. I do run Upstart Goblins in my other decks. I run Allure of Darkness. I run my pot cards. By running these kind of cards, there's a certain time to use them. Some people will use them right at the beginning, right, of their turn. They say they want to bait out an Ash. First of all, time out. Um, you're going to trigger a Droll and Lockbird. And secondly, a good player will not Ash your Upstart Goblin. If you do it on the first thing, because again, the odds of getting a card you need right at the beginning is so low. It's only a 2.86. Uh, so if your opponent upstarts you, let him, right? Because he's still probably going to brick. Or if they use that draw two pot card, don't ash it, right? Hold the ash or the labyrinth card or the branded fusion, right? Don't, don't, don't jump the gun. Instead, if you have these draw cards, which I'm a fan of keeping a couple in your deck, not many. I, I keep about two to three draw cards max, but I do like to have them in my deck. Use them. Try to do as much as the combo as you can, and then use them. Uh, unless you have, you're forced to use your pot, like at the, at the start of the main phase or something like that. And that's actually why I think they have you use it at the start of the main phase because of of this math. Let me go into a graph to show you what I mean. Now, this graph right here, this graph is the same raw data, but just put into a chart. And you could see here that the odds are less than 10% chance to get the card that you need and starts increasing dramatically as uh, you thin your deck. So when we use a card like Upstart Goblin to thin our deck and we use a combo, right? It is much better and more beneficial to wait and to use as many cards and mill as much as we can before uh, using the Upstart Goblin or Allure of Darkness or our pot cards. 
to increase the chance of getting the card we need or want. It could even just be a hand trap or something uh, to save the day. Again, uh, these are just uh, a bunch of, of, of numbers and stuff that I like to talk about. If you like these videos, please like and subscribe. Uh, I love talking about this stuff. I will see you guys next time. Bye.